All right, <laughs> so let's get started. Um, so this is the agenda for the day or, or for the afternoon. Um, and for many of you, it will probably be a refresher if you've done the program for a number of years. Um, but I know we have some new schools um, that are joining this year. So just wanted to make sure everyone gets the same information. Um, so we'll start off by talking about the awards process. Um, then we'll go into allocations and funding and how that is determined um, per school. Then we'll go into some general program guidelines, um, what um, is what are reimbursable costs, um, how to operate the program. Um, then we'll go into more the um, reimbursable costs and claiming, and then we'll wrap things up with resources. Um, so to start off with FFVP awards. Um, so for this school year, we have had um, or we're ha we have 196 schools that are going to be participating this school year. Um, we have eight new schools, um, which is exciting. Um, and I know many of you are on the call. Um, and as far as funding is concerned, um, we had um, we received 2.6 million in funds to schools, which um, sounds like a lot, but unfortunately this year we received less funding than in prior years. Um, over $200,000 um, was cut compared to um, the prior year. Um, so just wanted to make people aware of that because I know that um, some schools that participated in the past unfortunately weren't awarded this year because of the um, decrease in funding we received. Um, and we'll monitor it um, in future years um, to just see, see what that's gonna look like. Um, as far as um, the free and reduced percent goes, um, I was able to award at 33.48% free and reduced and above um, for the program um, in the past, um, 50% free and reduce was kind of like the, the threshold, um, but because across the state free and, free and reduce percentages are going down, um, I've been able to award well below the 50%. Um, and we have an awards list posted on our FFVP webpage. Um, so that's another place um, you can check um, to see which of your schools are participating. Um, as far as school selection criteria goes, um, so there are um, three things that um, are used. Um, one is um, the school must participate in the National School Lunch Program. Um, the second one is the school must be a combination of grades pre-K through eight. Um, so if you do have pre-Ks in your schools, um, they can participate in FFVP. And then priority um, must be given to schools with the highest free and reduced percent. Um, so these are three um, musts that um, we have to look at when awarding um, schools for FFVP. But there are some other criteria that we look at. Um, the first one is late claims. So um, if three or more late claims were submitted the prior school year, um, a corrective action plan or cap would need to be submitted to me um, and, and how it will be addressed in the future. And then we also look at fund usage. So um, I do a midpoint review as well as a year end. And if less than 25% by midpoint and less than 50% by year end um, funds are being used, then that's another consideration that's used for if your school is gonna be awarded. Um, and then we also look at um, other child nutrition programs. And if there are any concerns with those, that's another factor that's um, considered um, in being awarded the program because all schools have to be in good standing. So let's talk about the funding structure. So FFVP is a federal program and it runs on a federal fiscal year and not school year, which can create some challenges. Um, so 
for school year 2025. The funding um, is effective October 1 of 2024 through September 30th, 2025. Um, and so what this means is that funds would have to be saved at the end of the school year to operate in September of the following year, because again, it's federal fiscal year. So it runs October 1 through September 30th or across two school years. So what does this mean? Um, so if you are a returning school and you operated last school year, um, you're gonna be using leftover funds um, from school year 24 in, to operate in September. And then your new allocation will begin on October 1st. Again, it aligns with the federal fiscal year. <clears throat> if you're a new school, your program is not gonna start until October 1st because you don't have any September funds because um, the school wasn't operating FFVP last year. Um, but I would recommend to use September to plan, think about what you wanna offer um, to the kids and really use it as a, a time um, to, to start your program and get it off the ground. More about the allocations and um, to find out how much each of your school is getting. Um, we have an FFVP usage report in CMP web that you can refer to. Um, so once you log in, you'll want to select reports, then accounting reports, and then program year 2025, and then find your district. Um, and then I'll show you what that, what that looks like and how to read the report. And the allocations, just so everyone is aware, are based on a per student rate multiplied by the enrollment of the school. Um, and this is a federal regulation that we have to follow. And the per student rate has to be between $50 and $75 per student. So we can't um, do anything more or less with that. And that's the range we have to use. Um, and for this current year, um, we used $59 per student, which was the same as last school year. And um, this is because there's increased food cost and, um, and also because we did receive less funding, um, it helps it to go a little more. Um, so, so that was the dollar amount that was used. All right, so a little more about CMP web reports um, and what they should be used for. So the FFVP usage report, um, this is where you would go to see what each school is going to get for funding or allocations is another word. Um, it gives the updated balance by school based on the most recent claim that has been paid. And then it's a, also a great report to track the fund usage each month. Um, and this is a screenshot of where it is in the accounting reports. <clears throat> And then there's also a report called FFVP monthly claim. So this is a snapshot of each month's FFVP expenses. Um, so your operating costs, your administrative costs, um, which we'll go over when we talk about um, specifically costs and what are what's reimbursable in the program. So um, this is found under the claim report section. So the FFVP usage report, so this is what it looks like. Um, so it is broken down into three separate columns. So you have the amount column, which is how much each school is going to receive for the entire year. Um, and the PY rollover column, which is previous year rollover, those are your September funds. So if you are a new school, you won't see anything in that column because you, you don't have any carryover funds. Um, and then the October through September column, everyone should see a dollar amount there because that's when your school year 25 um, amount um, shows, shows up. And then you have a balance column which shows the balance based on claims that have been paid. Um, so it'll show you 
your rollover balance and then your October through September balance. And then there's a usage column, which gives you a percentage of um, how much funds have been used with each pot of money. So um, those are the, the different columns of the report. And if you ever have questions or aren't sure how to read the report, um, don't hesitate to email or call me. And then this is the monthly claim report. Um, you can download it or export it to Excel if you want to keep um, copies of it. Um, and so this breaks down each month what was claimed for operational costs versus administrative costs. Um, so you can see it's essentially a snapshot of each month. Um, and uh, if you are wondering like, oh, did I, did I miss something on my claim? Like this is a good report to refer to, to see if maybe something was missing. Um, so I would encourage to refer to this. Um, if you were to go to it right now, there likely isn't anything listed unless you file the August claim. Um, so. So next we're gonna talk about some general program guidelines. Um, and I always like to start off with the goals of FFVP because it's always helpful to keep these in mind when you're thinking of what you're gonna offer, um, what you're gonna introduce to the kids. And um, cause this is really, you know, the reason behind the program. Um, so the, the three goals are to, number one, expand the variety of produce students consume. So it's really about introducing them to new, new foods they haven't tried before. Um, number two, increase students' produce consumption. And number three, make a difference in students' diets to impact their present and future health. So it always is helpful to keep these in the back of your mind when operating the program. So how does it work? So this is kind of a very um, quick overview. So um, the fresh fruit and vegetable is available during the school day to all enrolled students. Um, it does have to be offered outside of breakfast and lunch times because it's a separate program under national school lunch. Um, so I know sometimes um, I'll get questions about this or there's some confusion like, oh, can I offer FFVP on my salad bar during lunch? Well, that's not allowed because you would be double dipping. So it's a completely separate program. Um, the school decides when, where, and how to implement the program. Um, and this is one of the great things about FFVP is there really is flexibility to develop your own plan and what's gonna work where and when you're going to serve um, and the plan is part of your annual FFVP application. Um, so if you're new this year, you can refer to what was submitted, although don't feel like you're tied down to it because things can change. Um, so don't feel like that's set in stone, but it could be something, um, a starting place. Um, and then it is a reimbursement program, like all of our other programs. So you would report your FFVP expenses on the site claim each month and then get um, reimbursed for those. So um, it initially comes out of your food service um, account and you would file, file your claim and then um, the FFVP deposit goes back um, into your school nutrition account. So what can you serve? So as the name implies, so it's fresh fruits and vegetables only. So no fruit leather, no craisins, no canned pineapple. Um, it's fresh product in its natural state. Um, you can offer dips with vegetables, um, but not fruits. So hummus and nut butters are some examples of um, dips, especially for vegetables that might be more um, palatable with um, a dip and um, to maybe help entice kids to, to try different things. 
um, in what form. Um, so you could do whole fruits and veggies like your apples, apples, bananas, oranges, um, but you're also allowed to do prepackaged fruits and vegetables. This can help um, with labor costs um, while also trying to balance um, quality, because I know depending on what you get, the quality can be better with some products than others. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And then you can also do pre-cut produce, especially for um, young kids where um, it might be a little easier for them to, to eat. So where can you source from? So really the sky is the limit for this. Um, commonly your, you know, normal food distributor can be used. Um, and from what I understand, many of them will do separate invoicing for FFVP. So that can be, um, really helpful, um, for when it comes time to file your claim. Um, you can source from local farms, um, but just make sure to not, um, also, um, get reimbursed under the state and federal local foods um, funds, because again, you would be double dipping with both. So you'd have to choose one or the other. Um, and then if you have a school garden or greenhouse that you partner with, um, they can, depending on who the organization is, they can um, invoice you for the cost of the produce, or they might, might even, you know, just give it to you and you don't have to pay for it. Um, so that's definitely an option. And then if you're a smaller school or district, um, grocery stores are a great, um, great resource, especially if you're only getting a small amount of product and you don't need cases of something. So those are all things that you can, <clears throat> all places that you can source from. Um, now, what about when and where to serve? Um, so we already talked about this a little bit. So it does have to be outside of breakfast and lunch times, um, whether it's a mid-morning snack or a mid-afternoon snack. Um, those are those are options. And within a school, you can do an AM snack for certain grades and a PM snack for other um, other grades. It really depends on how you want to set that up. Um, I've seen a lot of carts in the hallway. This can be helpful um, if you have a large school with um, different wings of the building and it's, it would be a lot of work to have your staff deliver to all classrooms. So the, the carts can be really helpful in the hallway. Um, delivering to the classroom is an option um, that we see probably the most frequently used. Um, and then also as far as when, um, during a locker break or other break during the school day or after PE class, because that's a nice, um, um, you know, partnership between phys ed and then eating a healthy snack after. Um, I would recommend that if you have some schools that offer breakfast after the bell and are participating in FFVP, uh, to consider serving in the afternoon versus the morning because um, it will likely compete with that breakfast program and doing it in the afternoon will give them um, the, the energy to get through the rest of the day um, before they leave at the end of the day. So <clears throat> that's something to, to think about as far as timing goes. Um, this is a question I get a lot is um, like, what are the minimum serving days? Um, like how often do I need to offer it each week? And the minimum is two days. Um, however, we would encourage more because it becomes a part of the student's day and they look forward to it. <clears throat> however, I also understand starting out small, especially if this is um, new to your school or maybe you have new staff um, to kind of get them uh, to ease them into it a little bit um, and you can always start with two days and then add a day um, as the year goes on so that's just something to think about um, and 
The number of days can be adjusted at any point during the school year. Again, you're not stuck to the, the plan that was in your application. Um, and if you find towards the end of the year or even mid-year, if you have low fund usage, I would definitely consider increasing the number of serving days so you can use all your money. Um, so other serving reminders, uh, we already talked about the dips. Um, they do have to be portion controlled if you're gonna offer those. And if you'd like to do a cooked vegetable, that is allowed one day per week. Um, for example, if you wanna try like roasted Brussels sprouts or um, sweet potato wedges or something like that. Um, but the, um, the only catch is that you would have to do a nutrition education component. So um, sending in some fun facts about whatever is being offered. So it's not like a, doesn't have to be super in depth, but just some education to go along with it. Um, I would also look at um, the time for your staff as well, because they're likely preparing for lunch at the same time. So um, is a cooked vegetable going to work in within their schedule? Um, and there's also no portion size requirements. So I would base it on the age of the students. So for example, if you have a pre-K through one school, you might do a quarter cup. And for older grades, you might do a half cup and then kind of see um, what you have for leftovers and waste and then kind of adjust it from there. Um, so <clears throat> with FFVP, you can um, get reimbursed for equipment to um, help with the operation of the program. Um, the equipment uh, does need to be approved by me at DOE Child Nutrition. And um, this would only be for large equipment costs. So like um, carts and then like in the slide, the sectionizer. Um, and we have an equipment request form on our website. So you would just download it, complete it and email it to me. Um, and there's no approval needed for like small wares, containers, um, those would all be considered supplies. So you don't need approval for that. And this is what the form looks like. Um, so it's, you know, it's just some basic um, questions, contact information, um, what piece of equipment that you want to purchase, um, what's the estimated cost, um, why is current equipment not efficient, and then if you would like to use it in other programs like breakfast or lunch, the cost would need to be prorated. Um, so this is all reviewed and looked at to justify um, why you need equipment. Because really the majority of funds should be going towards fruits and vegetables. So I wanted to share some equipment requests that I received um, last school year. So usually what I see is carts, again, if you're, you know, delivering to the classroom or um, distributing in the hallway, um, sectionizers are really big, I think, because, again, of efficiency, especially if you have a school of 500 kids and doing that all by hand um, would be a lot. So it can really help with efficiency with that. Um, I've received some core requests for pineapple and apples, um, reach in coolers if storage space is limited. And I also um, received a milk cooler um, request because some of the, some with some schools, students will come to the cafeteria and pick up for their class and then take it back and the milk coolers outside of the kitchen so they can easily come down, um, pick it up and then and they don't have to go into the kitchen. So, um, and then like I mentioned that the equipment costs would need to be prorated. So what about adults? Um, so 
The program is intended for students, but if there are teachers or ed techs that are directly responsible for serving, um, they can participate as well. And this is um, to help with modeling the behavior and trying to get students to try new foods, especially if it's something that's more unique and that the kids haven't seen before. It can be um, a nice way, you know, to encourage them to try it if, if their teacher is um, going to try it with them. Um, and they are encouraged to include a nutrition education component. Um, and it would only be allowed for teachers that are directly responsible for serving. Um, it's not available to the general teacher population. So um, whether it be the school nurse or, um, you know, someone else, the janitor or custodian can't, you know, pick up a piece of fruit and, um, and have it for a snack. Um, so I feel like this comes up a lot, especially if you're serving in the classroom and sometimes it's hard to get buy-in from teachers and other staff um, because it can seem like one more thing that they have to do. And even with custodians, like cleaning up after the kids. Um, so I just wanted to include some pointers for trying to get buy-in from staff. Um, and the first one being that it really does become a part of the student's day and they look forward to it. And it, it really can be a program that keeps them focused and gets them through the day or to lunch, depending on what time it's served. Um, and like, I can tell you that the schools that were not awarded last year, or if there's ever a school that um, isn't able to participate, like they, really miss it and they really see the value in in doing it so um it really um is something that is missed when it's not there so um so another example would be or another way to get teacher buy-in would be um you know having a teacher who's a champion of the program to explain it and talk to staff because you have teachers talking to teachers versus food service, you know, trying to, um, you know, persuade teachers to um, participate in the program. And, and sometimes that carries more weight. Um, so that's um, something that can be used. Um, I know of some schools that have done an all staff email explaining the program, or maybe, maybe it might help if it came from the principal explaining it to their staff, um, you know, try to try to make it as easy as possible, explain that, you know, you'll work within their schedule as as much as possible. Um, and this is where, you know, you might have a situation where you have um, some grades that will have a PM FFVP snack and then other grades that have a morning because you're trying to work with them um, and what works in their schedules. So these are just some things to keep in mind, especially if, you know, you're experiencing some pushback or you, ex you are expecting it and um, some ways to approach it. Now, nutrition education. Um, so this isn't a requirement of the program, but it will definitely make it more effective. And you can also tap into um, partner organizations that can help out um, to take the burden off of teachers. Um, so this includes like SNAPED, um, coordinators um, in your region, Cooperative Extension or Food Corps. Um, they can help out with um, the food education piece. And then um, fun facts to classrooms, morning announcements, um, promoting on the school website. Um, if you're not familiar with Team Nutrition, I would definitely check out their resources because they're free and um, they have information on nutrition education and my plate and um, or have some really great um, resources that you could take advantage of. And then um, if your school has a school garden and greenhouse or outdoor classroom, that's another um, great way to incorporate FFVP into some of those like outdoor opportunities. 
Um, this is a menu from RSU 23 in Old Orchard Beach. Um, it's very eye-catching and colorful. And um, even though FFVP menus aren't required, um, it can definitely draw more attention to the program and um, can also share with parents um, what their kids are trying, um, which they might not be aware of. So just wanted to share this um, sample that some other schools have used. Publicizing the FFVP, um, whether it's in your school or the greater community, um, it is a requirement and it's a question that we will that we ask on administrative reviews if we're um, visiting an FFVP school. Um, so I've included some some ways you can do that. Um, and then this parent letter I came across from another state that I thought was really nice and simple and explains the program to um, parents. So <clears throat> that's another way to get information out to the community. And then some good news I have to share, and this is something that um, I've been wanting to do for the last couple of years, is um, create some promo materials for FFVP um, that can be helpful for your schools because um, we know not everyone has the time to um, you know, market and create these resources. So some ideas um, I have are posters that can be hung in the hallways or carts if you're using those for um, the program, coloring books and, and pencils, fun things that the kids can use at um, like a field day or another fun event. Um, and then a toolkit to engage with teachers, parents, and students. And I have some examples of things that, um, you know, I've, I've been looking at that other states have created. So menu templates, sample fact sheets and announcements. Um, fun stuff like bingo cards with word searches, um, templates um, that you can use. So more like plug and play. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel. Um, and so these are my ideas, but if there's anything that you would like to see that would be helpful, like please contact me because I want it to be useful and something that um, you would you would use. So yeah. Um, so yeah, at least this is something that's exciting um, and is coming down the road. I don't expect um, it will be ready until the spring, um, but just keep, keep your eye out. And then this is a sample weekly snack menu that um, I pulled from, I think it was Minnesota Department of Education. And um, it's just another resource that can help um, with um, figuring out what to offer and maybe some different items. Um, so sometimes it's fun to look at um, other states' websites and just see what, what they're doing and what we can provide. So stay tuned for that, all of that stuff. Um, and then there is an FFVP on-site monitoring form um, that's to be completed by February 1st of every year, and it's filed internally. So you're not sending it to us. You would just complete and then maintain or um, file internally for when you have a review. That's when it would be looked at. Um, although I would recommend if you're new to do it sooner, like I would probably do it in October or November, just to make sure that the program is um, getting off the ground successfully and following the requirements. And it also gives you a chance to talk to um, the kitchen staff and teachers to see how it's going and make sure everyone's on the same page. All right, so let's talk about reimbursable costs and claiming. So how do you get your money? Um, so there are two um, categories of reimbursable costs. So you have operational and administrative. 
So operational would include food, so your fruits and vegetables, um, and then labor to prep, labor to serve, and then other costs, which includes supplies. So any non-food paper goods like napkins, and then supplies, cutting boards, paring knives, serving trays. Um, so anything that you might need for distributing to the classroom or um, in the hallway. And then your administrative costs, um, which are, you actually don't have to use any administrative. Um, you can use all towards fruits and vegetables and then um, kitchen labor. But if you, if you want to use administrative, that would be typically the food service director's time to order product, prepare the claim. And then this would also in include any large equipment purchases. So think like the coolers, refrigerators, carts um, that you would need um, and need to be approved for before you purchase. Um, and it's important to, to keep in mind with administrative that less than 10% of your total funds can be put towards admin costs. Um, so just think of that in terms of budgeting. And if you, if you find you need a cooler or maybe you don't have storage space, how much is that gonna cost? And are you gonna go over the 10%? This is what the site claim looks like in CNP web. So each month, it's part of the monthly claim process. So you're entering your operating and administrative costs if you choose to claim those. Um, <clears throat> the administrative equipment, um, so that would be any of your large equipment, per large equipment purchases. Um, for your supplies and your small wares, that's going to be operating other cost because because if you put it under administrative, it's going to be part of the 10%. So you'll go through, enter in the boxes. Um, and if you, this typically happens towards the end of the school year or when you're trying to um, claim for September, if you're currently participating, you will get an error message if you go over either the 10% admin or if what you're claiming exceeds your allocation. So your claim won't go through because um, you don't have enough money essentially. So that's just something um, to be aware of. And then I wanted to make everyone aware that um, we do have the sponsor claim um, will show a warning in certain instances. Um, so in this example, there are two FFVP operating sites, but none of them have entered a claim for FFVP. So this is just a warning message to whoever the claim preparer is that you have two schools that are operating FFVP, but there weren't any expenses claimed and that's okay. It's just a warning. Your claim will still go through. So a good e example of this would be in August. So if you didn't operate, like if school didn't start for you until after Labor Day, you're not gonna have any August, you know, expenses. Um, so then, so that's okay because you didn't operate in, in August. Um, it's just an edit check so that you don't miss claiming a school. So that's how the whole reason why it was set up that way. Um, another helpful tab that you can go into um, to help with um, payments and how much you've been paid to date for FFVP is under the payments tab. So there's one for lunch, breakfast, um, produce, if you're um, participating in the local foods for schools program, there's a separate um, section for FFVP. So it'll show you how much you've been paid to date for that program. Um, 
and it's by district and not school. So that's something to be aware of. As far as monitoring fund usage goes, um, so I would encourage everyone to keep on top of this, monitor, monitor it throughout the year, compare to um, the FFVP usage report to see where you're at, because um, we do a mid-year evaluation of fund usage, typically in February or March. Um, so if less than 40% of funds have been spent to date, um, you will get an email from me um, asking to submit a plan if you plan on using all the funds or if there's a percentage that I can reallocate to other schools because I typically get a lot of reallocation requests towards the end of the school year because um, some people are running out of money. Um, so I will reallocate to schools that um, have asked me like, oh, if you have any, if, if you know of any funding that isn't gonna be used, can you transfer it? So I kind of keep a running list of those schools. Um, but just a heads up that, um, that I will monitor the funds throughout the year. And speaking of reallocating funds, um, so typically those requests come in towards the end of the school year, um, but I will kind of get them as the year goes on. So um, this can happen if one school in a district is running low and they'll you know email me and ask, oh, can you transfer funds from X school to Y school? or they might need more money outside of the district. Um, and when those requests come in, um, I would just, you know, say that it might take me up to a week for the transfer to happen, especially when claims are due because I'll get five or six requests. And sometimes I won't know how much money I have to work with until the claims have gone through and have been paid. Um, so if um, you've asked for reallocations in the past, um, to just be aware of this, to allow up to a week for that to happen, um, because there's a lot of things that need for me to do behind the scenes to make sure that I can transfer money. So that's just something to be aware of. And then um, CMP web isn't, isn't perfect and glitches happen. So that might also be a factor in me transferring money. Um, so sometimes it can take longer than expected, but you know, at the end of the day, my goal is to maximize our fund usage as a state. And I will try to give schools more money if they need it so that they can finish out the year. And then also so that we can use funding and there isn't as much left on the table. Um, so just some things to be aware of. Um, as far as budgeting tips, especially if this is your first year, um, develop a budget for each school and monitor it like we talked about. Um, communicate frequently with your staff, especially the people that are placing food orders to avoid over or underspending. Um, maybe give them a monthly budget or give them a weekly budget where so they know like what their parameters are. Um, conduct a mid-year review of spending and adjust accordingly if you need to, and then track carefully, um, you know, do your own internal tracking, but then also compare to the, the FFVP usage report um, to see where you're at. All right, so we're gonna wrap things up with some resources and then have time for questions. Um, so these are some good resources to be aware of and um, bookmark on your computers. So the FFVP handbook from USDA, um, that is a really helpful tool. Um, it goes over all of the nuts and bolts of the program. Um, anytime you're wondering if something, can I serve this or is this allowed? refer to the handbook because um, that's what I do. <laughs> and um, there's also a FFVP fact sheet from USDA that if you want to 
print it off, share with um, administration or um, share with your staff so that they <clears throat> understand the program. And then we also have a sample budgeting tool that um, I had, are borrowed from Kansas. And so this can help um, as an internal tool to stay on track with spending. And then lastly, these are just some ideas to think outside of the box and um, use funding and it, you know, engage with staff and teachers and make it, um, you know, make it a fun program for everyone involved. Um, so holding a kickoff event, involving the PTO to get teachers and parents on board. Um, especially for parents of that maybe maybe their families just moved into the district or maybe their kids are just starting off in pre-k or kindergarten and they don't even know that the program existed um, so it's like thinking of um, you know what what do parent like do we do parents even know about the program um, reaching out to your distributors on products they offer for FFVP. Maybe they have some special items that you can order. Um, working with a local orchard, featuring a different main apple each week, um, and then pairing more exotic produce with some of the more common ones that they're familiar with. Because again, the goal is to expose them to different products. So um, that concludes the training for today. Um, and we will see if we have any questions in the chat box. Um, Actually, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. OK. But we do have one question. All right, we have a question. It has to do with the, the sign that was at the beginning of the okay. presentation. Where can we get them? Oh, okay. <laughs> About the sign, the farm signs. The so farm we signs. have plenty of those. So if um, you are partnered with a farmer, we can get those to you. So whoever in, whoever asked that question, email me and um, I'll figure out how to get it to you. Because they're not easily mailed. Yeah, they're not easily mailed. They're pretty good sized signs <laughs> that are visible from a distance. <laughs> Can we use non-local fruits and veggies for this program, like the sample of star fruit? Yes. So the product doesn't, it does not have to be local. Um, it can be um, domestic. And with the star fruit example, um, so I'm pretty sure that that doesn't meet by American based on where it's grown, but um, it would be an example of an exception that isn't grown in significant quantities in the US. So I think it would be okay for you to offer it for FFVP for the purposes of education and exposing to different products. Is the 10% admin for September in addition to the previous months? No, the so the so the ten percent admin applies to your total allocation, um, and that runs from October through September. So if your total allocation was ten thousand dollars, you only have a thousand to use from October through September. So it it doesn't restart. We have a question coming in. We do. <laughs> oh, just looking forward okay. to the banners and posters when they're available. A comment. Yes, I am very excited about those promo materials. They have been um, something that I've wanted to do for a while. So, and, and like I said, if anyone has suggestions for what would be helpful um, materials, send me an email and 
we can see if we can make it work. Not seeing any more. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for joining. And um, if you have any questions after the training, um, don't hesitate to reach out. So hope everyone has a great rest of your day.